Hello again, and welcome to chapter 18 on psychosocial development in late adulthood. So this is generally considered to be from the age of 65 until death. Let's begin by gaining an understanding of what our friendships and social lives look like when we are in late adulthood. So the first term that you will need to know is role discontinuity. This is something that we see a lot of people in late adulthood experience. It's the abrupt and disruptive change that's caused by the conflicts among one's various roles in life. So now their friends and family um, might have been dying or have died as they get older, and so this leaves them with kind of a new role. Perhaps if their spouse dies and now they're a widow, um, they're no longer a wife or a husband. They might be retired now and they've given up that role of worker. Perhaps for the first time in their life they have grandkids and so they have to take on this new role of being a grandparent. And so this role discontinuity um, often leads to what we call crossover. And crossover is when we kind of see this switch in uh, gender roles or in femininity and masculinity. Older men become more like women, and older women become more like men, um, at least stereotypically. So we see that women tend to become more comfortable with their aggression and their egocentric impulses. Men tend to become more comfortable with their nurture, nurturative and affiliative impulses, um, meaning that they want to get to know people better and connect with them and bond with them and communicate more. So this move towards androgyny allows men and women to see that they actually have more in common than they are different. And so this usually allows men and women to get along very well, in some cases better than they had gotten along with the opposite sex in their entire life. Okay, let's watch a clip of Bill Cosby putting these concepts of role discontinuity and crossover into examples from his own life. My mother and father come over to the house quite often. They're grandparents now. Funny. They're funny people. I've never seen such a turnaround in all my life. <laughs> my father came over to the house, sat down, went into his pocket and pulled out a handful of, of money and began to pass it out to the children, you know, he, he made the announcement. Now let's see if granddad has any money for these wonderful children. <laughs> well, five children came from everywhere. <laughs> see, the priorities are there. Money for the children. They heard that, understood it, and responded. <laughs> see, anything else is money for the children, money for the children, money for the children. You have to say it like that. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. So they can hear. My father began to pass this money out. And I thought, this is the same man who, when I was his child, I would ask him for 50 cents. This man would tell me his life story. <laughs> and my father never told a happy story. For 50 cents, there never was happiness. The man ate dirt till he was 30 years old. That's all it was, was dirt. And he was thankful to eat that dirt. That's the part I couldn't understand. No matter how much he suffered, he'd always say, and I was thankful to get it. My father walked to school four o'clock every morning with no shoes on uphill both ways and five feet of snow and he was thankful I asked my father to give me a dollar for the school picnic he told me how he killed a grizzly bear with his loose leaf notebook Now he's giving money away. My mother kisses every child. 
Well, just come here and kiss your grandmommy. <laughs> grandmommy just love it to death. And my children think that my mother is the most wonderful person on the face of this earth. And I keep telling my children, that's not the same woman I grew up with. <laughs> you are looking at an old person who's trying to get into heaven now. Yes, my mother, now a grandmother. Same woman when I was her child could not stand my room. The woman would come up and look at my room and say, Would you look at this filth? Now, I've already been in the room five hours. She wants me to look at it. I said, Look at it! My mother was an authority on pig styes. This is the worst looking pig sty I have ever seen in my life. And I want it cleaned up right now. How anyone can live in this filth is beyond me. I love it when they give you another thing coming. If you think that I was put on this earth to be your slave, you've got another thing coming. And mothers are always more interested in the condition of your underwear than your body if you're ever in an accident. And they tell you that. I hope for my sake, if you're ever in an accident, you have on clean underwear. Well, I thought that's what an accident was. Look, you're driving a truck. Here comes another truck, going to hit you. Now, whether you hit the truck or not, you're going to have soiled underwear. Because first you say it, then you do it. here comes your mother to the hospital. Did he have on clean underwear? Yes, we found it in the glove compartment. I love it when they get so angry they can't remember your name. You come here, uh, Roy, uh, Rufford, uh, Rutabaker, what is your name, boy? And don't lie to me, because you live here, and I'll find out who you are. Take a stick and knock your brains out. I always wanted to get some calves brains. Keep them in my hand. My mother hit me in the head, I'd throw them on the floor. But knowing my mother, it wouldn't work. She said, put your brains back in your head. If you let your brains fall out of your head, have you lost your mind? And that's another thing. They ask you a question, you try and answer, they tell you to shut up. Day and night, night and day, work my fingers to the bone for what? I don't... Shut up! <laughs> and when I ask you a question, you keep your trap shut. Think I'm talking to hear myself talk? Answer me! Make me sick. I'm just sick of this and I'm sick of you. So sick, I don't know what to do with myself. Now, I am just sick and tired. And tired always followed sick. Worst beating I ever got in my life. My mother said, I am just sick. I said, and tired. I don't remember anything after that. But you see, fathers are altogether different. I'm not saying they're better. I'm saying they're different. See, my father established our relationship when I was seven years old. He looked at me and said, you know, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. <laughs> and it don't make no difference to me because I'll make another one look just like you. <laughs> and because of my father, between the ages seven through 15, I thought my name was Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Jesus Christ! <laughs> and my brother Russell thought his name was Dammit. Damn it, will you stop all that noise? And Jesus Christ, sit down! So one day I'm out playing in the rain. My father said, Damn it, will you get in here? I said, Dad, I'm Jesus Christ. But you see, fathers are more fun than mothers. 
because fathers are the only people in the house who are allowed to have gas. <laughs> and they don't care either. They just sit right there and... Oh. And you always know when they're finished because they say, oh boy. <laughs> My father would do it and blame it on invisible animals. Oh. You see that elephant run under there? And my brother was dumb enough to look for it. <laughs> now here comes my mother. All right, did oh Lord, what happened then? Yeah. So, Mom, there's an elephant under Dad's chair. Did you see it? No, but it lifted Dad up about two feet. Do you know my father's favorite game? Come here and pull my finger. Another study found that in late adulthood, in terms of our friendships, um, males trust their best friends more than women trust their best friends. And men tend to have less personal conversations with friends than, their women, uh, than women do. And this is actually a finding that we see all throughout life. Um, women like to talk about relationships generally when they're engaging in a conversation with a friend. And men tend to like to talk about topical subjects, um, sports, politics, career, weather, um, things that you might see in the news that aren't too controversial, but do spark an interesting, enlightening conversation. So let's take a look at um, sexuality and love in late adulthood and see what we know about that. So research shows that 75% of 65 to 75 year olds report being satisfied with their sex life. 30% of men were dissatisfied with the frequency and only 20% of women were dissatisfied with the frequency. So the idea that as you get old you stop having sex and it's upsetting to you um, is just not supported by the research. Most people are satisfied and most people are not dissatisfied with the amount of sex that they're having. Another finding in research is that our um, need and desire for sex stays pretty consistent throughout our life. So if sex was really important to you when you're 30, sex is going to be just as important to you when you are in your late adulthood, which is also contradictory to what most people think. Um, at, most people think that as you age, you get less and less sexual desire, but that's just not what the research shows. What it does show is that older adults often feel uncomfortable expressing their sexuality. Their desire doesn't decrease, but they may consider talking about sex taboo because of the time that they grew up. They may feel unattractive due to society's portrayal of what the ideal body image is or what sexy looks like. And usually the media portrays sexy as being youthful. They might be concerned about their sexual performance. Um, we talked before about how much the self-fulfilling prophecy affects erectile dysfunction. And so if you believe that when you age you will not be able to get an erection, then it's more likely that you won't be able to. So um, erectile dysfunction is the inability to engage in the sexual act by achieving an erection. It's often caused by internal fears, um, that performance anxiety that we talked about before, Unsupportive partners is another predictive factor of erectile dysfunction and or physical changes. Uh, with the heart and blood pressure changing, sometimes that affects the ability to get an erection. But more times than not, it's due to psychological uh, reasons. In fact, in one sleep study, we found that men that thought they had erectile dysfunction were still getting erections in their sleep. Because... Every time we go into REM sleep at night, um, our body goes into this fight or flight response and our heart rate goes up and our breathing rate increases. It's a very active stage of sleep. And so we see males get erections every time they enter into this REM stage of sleep, about five to six times a night. And so because they're not having this performance anxiety while they're asleep or because they're not thinking that they're not going to get an erection, they are able to actually achieve an erection. So um, we know that although most uh, erectile dysfunction is psychological, there is uh, one factor that can contribute to this erectile dysfunction, 
which is a prostatectomy, um, and that's removal of all or part of the male prostate gland. Um, some men are subject to um, prostate cancer, and so removing this can be preventative. But we do know that men can use Viagra or a prosthetic penile device if they are experiencing erectile dysfunction due to a prostatectomy or for any reason. So we all know about Viagra and Cialis, uh, pills that get the body um, to have the appropriate blood flow to maintain an erection. Um, but some of us might not be aware of a penile prosthetic. So a penile prosthetic is an implant. Um, it's here on the slide. So it gets implanted into the penis and then there is a contraption that goes into the testicles and essentially you squeeze the testicles to pump the penis into an erection. Okay, so let's watch a short clip on erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction or impotence is a condition wherein a man experiences inability to achieve and maintain an erection for a satisfying sexual experience. Erectile dysfunction commonly occurs in elderly people because the erectile capacity decreases with age. Erectile dysfunction may occur when the blood vessels going to the penis become blocked or narrowed. There is an interference with the nervous system that triggers erection or when there is a reduced libido. Certain diseases may cause blockage or narrowing of the blood vessels such as diabetes, hypertension, multiple sclerosis, nerve damage, hormonal imbalances, atherosclerosis, and heart diseases. Unhealthy lifestyle choices also predispose an individual to have erectile dysfunction. A person is more likely to develop erectile dysfunction if he is obese, alcoholic, smoking, or abusing drugs. Medications may also cause erectile dysfunction as its side effects, like with antihypertensives, antipsychotics, antidepressants and tranquilizers. Psychological causes can play a part in the occurrence of erectile dysfunction. People suffering from stress, fear, gloom, uncertainties, sadness or problems in the relationship can suffer from erectile dysfunction. Often erectile dysfunction is caused by a combination of physical and psychological causes. A person who suffers from erectile dysfunction may experience symptoms that include difficulty getting an erection, inability to maintain an erection, and decreased libido or sexual desire. Lifestyle modification is the least invasive type of treatment for erectile dysfunction. Healthy lifestyle choices that can help relieve erectile dysfunction are to stop smoking, drink alcohol moderately, lose weight when you're overweight, stay away from substance abuse and to be physically active. Erectile dysfunction caused by medication can be treated by replacing or cutting back the medication under guidance of a physician. Psychotherapy is used to treat erectile dysfunction caused by stress and anxiety. It is also important to talk with your partner about your complaints. Medications like phosphodiesterate inhibitors and testosterone can also be utilised. These medications can only be taken orally, injected directly to the penis or inserted into the tip of the penis. Your general practitioner can give you more information about the disorder and its possible treatments. So sadly, in late adulthood, we see an increase in widowhood. Between the two genders, it's actually women that often become the widows because on average they live seven years longer than men and they marry men four years older than them on average. So they're much more likely to become the widower. Um, and being in late adulthood can make it challenging for women to find sexual partners. 
However, recent technology is helping widows to have romance and to date. Um, we've seen an increase of elderly people on uh, social and dating websites like Match.com, eHarmony, etc. So in terms of love, we see two types of love really become the focal point of relationships in late adulthood. So the first type of love is generative love. This is common in late adulthood, but it's most characteristic of parenthood, of being a grandparent. This is um, a type of love which sacrifices are gladly made for the sake of the children. And then the next type of love that we see elderly people engage in is called existential love. And this is really the capacity to cherish the present moment, to live in the now. Um, perhaps this is when we kind of confront the certainty of our own personal death and, and realize that we don't have much time left, so we better value the time we do have. It's said that existential love is the type of love that allows grandparents to be so patient and so tender with their grandkids. And some um, o older people and researchers argue that this type of love is actually one of the greatest gifts of growing old. Research shows that Feeling loved by fr uh, family, friends, significant others, and being able to love is just as important in late adulthood as it is in adolescence or any other stage of your life. One study found that elderly people that are put in nursing homes that are deprived of love and touch are actually more likely to die than elderly people that still feel loved and are hugged and kissed and shown that love. Okay, speaking of loving relationships, we know that couples who have children later in their relationship may still actually have dependent children at the time they retire. And this can cause financial hardship on the couple because when we're retired, we're usually not making as much money as we were when we were working, but we're still having another person to pay for. Uh, we also know that partners in marriage lasting longer than 20 years actually show lower levels of disease and disability in late adulthood. Specifically, hypertension and arthritis are lower in married people. We also have found that widowers and divorcees report more disease and disability than other relationship statuses, a committed relationship or marriage, for example. When we look at the relationship between older um, parents and their adult children, we find that generally when they do have conflict, it's most often about lifestyle choices and habits. Um, maybe the uh, older parents will tell their adult children um, what to eat or how to act or what to wear or um, that they're drinking too much or how to parent, for example. And we see that when middle-aged children get upset at their older parents, they're often arguing with them about uh, the way that they're being communicated with, the interaction style. They don't like how they're being talked to. They feel like they're still being treated like a kid, even though they are a full-grown adult. Another issue that arises for some in late adulthood is widowhood. Widowhood is extremely stressful for most late adults. We know that sudden death is harder to cope with than an anticipated death, like illness, for example. This um, widowhood often produces new relationships with relatives and friends, and so those changes, although they can be positive, are stressful. We know that when a person becomes a widow, they often have new responsibilities that they might not have had before. Maybe a, ma a male has to now do his own cooking if he was you know, following the traditional gender stereotypes. And maybe the woman now has to wash the cars if she wasn't before. We know that when we look at uh, the two genders and compare which one has a harder time with becoming a widow, we tend to see that men have a harder time coping with being a widow than women do. Okay, let's go ahead and watch a video now on widowhood. ...of living even one more day can seem insurmountable if you're alone and have no way of taking care of yourself. Too many frail, disabled, elderly people have no place to go. Uh, social programs used to provide some 
uh, dignity and security for those in nursing homes, but many of those programs have been cut back or scrapped entirely. Nearly two million people in our country find being sick and dependent almost unbearable. Thirty-five percent of all sick elderly Americans will spend their life savings in a nursing home before they die. Ellen Haynes is a former governess. She's 94. I couldn't live by myself. If I hadn't had a stroke, I would have to be in a home like this because you can't live by yourself no more. People go in there and beat you up. Kill you. They didn't do that when I come along. Because if I had a knew that I was going to be like this, I would have made more arrangements for myself. Because this way I didn't make nothing. The doctors put me here. I wanted to go back in my own little apartment with one hand. I would have tried to make it. I would have made it. That they said, no, I couldn't. So. Whether they live in nursing homes or not, one of the mysteries of the biological clock is that it runs out sooner for men than for women. Dr. Carl Eisdorfer, University of Miami. It may very well be that we're going to have to not only look at ways to help the elderly women, but ways to understand why men die younger when we're supposed to be equally uh, uh, sexually uh, unbiased. And it's clear that men are not doing as well. Uh, maybe it's because of their lifestyles, maybe it's because of the macho image that says that the man doesn't talk to anybody, you know, he takes it, and maybe this has some real untoward effects on stress and so on. But clearly the difference in sexes has now become, and mortality and morbidity has become large enough to become, I think, a significant social problem. In Chicago, a unique residential center. It provides community living for those who have lost their spouses. Most of them are women. They share daily work and memories. One of the residents in this group home is Miriam Heifetz, who lost her husband a year ago. We were married for over 50 years. It was the best thing that ever happened in my life. The love for my husband grew. It just grew. It made my life. I mean, this was it for me. And when I look back at it, I have only the... the most inner, innermost beautiful, wonderful thoughts about him because our life was good. We had a good life together. We understood each other. We, we went through whatever we had to go through together. And there's nothing, nothing that I can think of in our marriage that would have made it any more the most wonderful thing for me. The, the reason I decided I can't live alone anymore was I was terribly lonely. I went through a period of deep depression. I would have to go shopping. I would go into that supermarket and I would stand there. I wouldn't know what to buy. A nursing home I never even thought of, never. The group in living appealed to me because it would take care of the lonesomeness. I wouldn't be alone. Many women go through this. Unfortunately, we're in a period of our lives where the men die earlier than the women. Uh, but I have to change my way of living because I live by myself in the apartment, the Albany Park. 
and I was very lonely. I did live with my daughter before I came here, but uh, it didn't work out. And uh, I, I was the one that wanted to get out. Many women lonely. do not want to live with their children. Their children have different lives, different interests, and all it would mean is they'd become a burden. This is the hurdle that women have to deal with, and everyone deals with it in his own way. Miriam's way is a friendship with another widow, her roommate, Trudy Leskowitz. Was supposed to do, and of course I had to do it four times over and over and over again. That's what took all this time. And careful, it's hot. So how's your daughter? Didn't she come today? She will come, Trudy. I told you three times today. They're all coming tonight. Mm -hmm. The whole shebang. My daughter-in-law, my son-in-law, and my granddaughter. We get together as a family, and those are highlights in my life. Really highlights. I have children, two children. I have grandchildren. And I have great-grandchildren five great-grandchildren. I love them for who they are. I have a, a relationship with them that is very precious to me. Oh, good. The other day when we were all together, my daughter brought out a little diary that I had kept when I started, when I was 10 years old. Went to my first party. Had a pretty good time. So far, I like wink. <laughs> Post office. <laughs> and spin the bottle. <laughs> There's a thread that goes through your whole life. And when you see some of that, in your own children, you feel that your life was not in vain. You feel that you, that you lived a good life. You feel that you, you did what you possibly could under the circumstances. And uh, there's a, f a good feeling of knowing that your children have learned from what you have gone through, what your life has meant. Often in late adulthood, elderly people need some type of specialized care, but when um, our aging parents have to have some type of caregiver, either a nursing home or a live-in nurse, this can create some concerns about if the elderly person is going to feel lonely, if they're going to be abused, um, what type of coping strategies they're going to have and be able to use to get through any loneliness or abuse they might endure. There's something called caregiver stress syndrome, which happens to um, people that are taking care of elderly people, often um, kids that are taking care of their elderly parents, not kids, but adult children that are taking care of their elderly parents. So caregiver stress syndrome is considered a pathological morbid change in physical and psychological functioning due to chronic stress. So it can be very stressful taking care of elderly patients and this can cause people to become fatigued and have kind of that reaction that we talked about uh, with stress in terms of the general adaption syndrome and the effect that stress can have on our bodies. Many nursing homes have wonderful staff that are trained to deal with this type of stress However, there are some reported cases of people that don't have the coping abilities to take care of the elderly and may engage in elder abuse. So it's actually becoming a problem that we're paying more attention to in our society as these types of cases are actually on the rise. In terms of grandparenthood, uh, we find that being a grandparent is actually positively linked to mental health and morale in late adults. There are five styles of grandparents that we have researched or found through research, and they are the formal grandparent, the fun seeker, the surrogate parent, the reservoir of wisdom, and the distant figure. So you're going to be doing an activity where you'll get to know these types of um, grandparents better. 
so I'll let you figure that out in a minute on your own. But just so you know, the most popular styles are the ones with the least amount of authority. So the fun seeker grandparent and the distant figure are the most common types of grandparent styles that we see. And this is usually because late adults just want to enjoy being with their grandkids. They don't want to co-parent. They already did that. They're done with that. They want to just uh, enjoy the good parts of being around kids. However, uh, we do know that there are over 2 million grandparents raising their children in the U.S. right now. So with that, I'd like you to head on over to Moodle, complete lecture activity number one, and then return to this point in the lecture. In terms of working in late adulthood, we know that the elderly are working now more than ever before. It's estimated that up to 15% of late adults do work. There is one field that is kind of the exception to this age discrimination law, uh, and so this field has to do with public health and safety. For example, only airline pilots and public safety workers, like firefighters and police, can be forced to retire due to their age. And then it, it's just cited that this is a public safety requirement. We know that people are working now more than ever before because of increased opportunities in the workplace due to social security reform, and then some elderly people just cite that they like to continue working for personal and professional rewards. So studies have been done on the stereotype about performance decreasing with age and found absolutely no relationship. In fact, experience allows us to perform well when we're in late adulthood. Even if we have fading sensory, physical, or cognitive abilities, we still have a wealth of knowledge to pull from that maybe our younger coworkers don't have. Also, research shows that late adults tend to have less absenteeism, turnover, illness, and accident rates than younger adults. And late adults have higher job satisfaction and more positive work values than younger workers, as cited by bosses and employers. Another major milestone that happens in life is retirement, and of course this usually occurs in late adulthood. Many people actually welcome retirement because they're either bored at work or they're frustrated, sick of getting up every Monday at 6 a.m. But others experience the same financial and psychological hardships as unemployed people do. In fact, nearly 80% of baby boomers say they plan to keep working after the age of 65, and some of them decide this because of personal reasons, that they don't want to get bored by staying at home, they want to keep their mind active, but they also cite some financial reasons. So let's take a look at a video that explains these financial issues that come with retirement. And they all lived happily ever after. Happily ever after. What a crock. I don't know how I would retire, but I intend to one day. Sweetheart, there is nothing under the bed. Here it is, the monster. Okay, 20 years from now, I will be 62. I will be $32,184 in debt. I think a good retirement for the American public is pretty much a fairy tale at this point. Every day we have 10,000 baby boomers reaching retirement, collecting their Social Security benefits. Social Security is bankrupt. <gasps> what? Young people have come to wonder what would be their lot when they came to old age. Social Security got going without anybody thinking about who's going to pay the bills. Retirement should be a three-legged stool. There should be some personal savings, a pension, and the guarantee of Social Security. It's like we don't even really know what that looks like. There's all these social structures that we've relied on in the past. Pensions, you know, this idea of working in a company for 30 years and retiring. We're on sort of the last generation of that. The third pig planned on touring the enchanted forest in an RV. 
My grandparents have an RV. Bet your granddad has a pension. No, it's a Winnebago. <laughs> what do you think they're... Okay. Well, my retirement plan right now is called a life insurance policy. No, no, no. Uh, no, my retirement plan right now is Social Security. I have a 401k with uh, not enough in it. You're hungry. It's funny because I can hear my wife in my ear right now. What are we doing about that? I don't think there'll ever be a retirement. I don't. I see what my mom is doing at 72 years old. We're looking at a much greater financial burden on Social Security than it once had. It's obviously supposed to be the first leg of the stool, not the whole stool. We have a nice view. When it comes to having to move... I'll miss it. It's exhausting. If this continues for six more months, we have to make radical life changes. Oh, we got a problem, honey. I think about where two old people will end up. <laughs> no. We're going this way. It's a moral issue. I'm actually nervous. If the ultimate test of a moral society is the world we leave our children, our grandchildren, this country's failing and failing miserably at it. Yeah, kind of yeah. Nick Triana. You can't solve big problems with what fits on a bumper sticker. Maybe you should just give up the notion that you get to retire. Change what you do. Incoming. Everyone's living longer. You can have people who are retired for 30 or 40 years. Is that a sustainable system over a long period of time? Who's feeling young now? We need to have an adult conversation in this country around the issue of what does retirement mean? There's always a time to save. Let me set the clock and start back at square one and move forward in a new way. Happily ever after isn't what it used to be. Retirement is no fairy tale. Yikes! No! It's another kind of story altogether. All right, so there's actually six different styles or types of retirees that you're going to be learning about when you complete lecture activity number two. Uh, but we do find that the way you spend your leisure time throughout your life affects your view of retirement in the future. For example, some people relax by doing easy work tasks at home, gardening, laundry, some people may party heavily at the end of the week to deal with the stresses of work. People with desk jobs may exercise to stay physically active. But the point being that generally what you do for leisure while you work ends up spilling over to what you will do for leisure as a retired person. And since pretty much your whole day is about leisure, uh, we see the same activities going on. Uh, that were going on in adulthood or adolescence, but now they're just happening um, all day or the majority of your day. There is an emphasis on utilizing retired people as a resource for society, the government, or their fields of expertise. Volunteer work or paid jobs, consulting, helps retired people to feel valuable. And so some psychologists argue that we need to get them an active role in our society, because they have a lot of wisdom and advice to offer us, and if we gave them positions in our society or government or as consultants in their field of expertise, um, then we might be gaining some valuable insight from them, and they might also be gaining a sense of confidence and a sense of um, being valued. Alright, with that, go ahead and pause the video, head on over to Moodle, and complete the next lecture activity. And then we'll see you back here when you are finished. Once we hit late adulthood, are we done growing and developing as people? Or do we continue to kind of change and adapt and uh, have a different outlook on life? Well, the Committee of Human Development found that older adults focus on personal development in the following ways. First of all, they become more introspective. Um, looking at kind of who they are and what makes them tick and what their belief systems are and why they believe what they believe. We find that they are more willing to accept that there are aspects of the environment that cannot be controlled, meaning that they 
come to realize that there's certain things that are just out of their control, out of their power, like you can't change other people. Um, and they become more acutely aware of the fact that they um, can control how they're feeling and the emotions that they're dealing with. And because of that, we see that their intensity of emotions does decline. They tend to have less emotional energy. Um, they don't care about things that they might have cared about when they were younger. Uh, maybe those things now seem more trivial or pointless or not of use. Like we've talked about several times throughout this lecture, we also see kind of those traditional gender roles become reversed, whereas uh, women tend to become more assertive in old age and men become a little softer. And then finally, um, personal development in late adulthood also has to do with age status, what is considered normal at a given age. And so in late adulthood, age status becomes very clear cut to elderly people. It becomes more rigid. They have rules that they really adhere to and hold true partially because of their life experiences and their own wisdom. For example, they might think that by age 27, people need to be married. And by age 32, people need to have kids. And so this age status or this social clock becomes very important to them and they might have developed some hard and fast rules about the best way to live according to your age. So as people in our lives are growing old, what should our relationships with them look like? There's really two theories of how we should approach our relationships with elderly people and how elderly people should approach their relationships with people close to them. The first theory is the activity theory, and this theory says that human beings who are able to keep up social activity of their middle years um, are considered the most successful in late adulthood. And then there's the disengagement theory, which is that most mature adults are likely to gradually disengage themselves from their fellow human beings as they begin to mentally prepare for death. So they begin to accept the decreasing attention of society and focus on internal concerns like contemplating spirituality. Some researchers believe that this is what's most healthy for them is to kind of disengage um, and come to terms with where they're at in life rather than to fight the inevitable decreasing attention of society and to repress those concerns that they might have about the afterlife or what death is like, for example. Okay, let's go ahead and watch a video on a woman that uh, is 105 years old and she will discuss some of her life experiences and how they've shaped her personal development. Good to hear from you, bless you. For a grandmother or great-grandmother in this case, a phone call from family is one of the best gifts possible. Today, Jesse Jordan is getting many presents and well wishes. No wonder she's turning 105. And to be able to so sit down and interview a woman with Jordan's life experience she is also a gift. Can you come happens. closer? Though it requires leaning in and speaking up a little. What is it like to be 105? It's different because you never know when the next minute is. And Jordan could never have guessed her life would contain so many. Though her room at Shepherd Village isn't big enough to hold all her mementos, it's full of snapshots of the past. Oh, that's my husband. She's long since outlived her husband, though they were married for 68 years. That's him, Charles. That's him, yeah. That's the Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> the Englishman that your dad didn't want you to marry. <laughs> Apart from her husband, her other love was swimming. One she discovered as a little girl in Dundee, Scotland. Dundee had the first swimming pool in Scotland at that time, and it was the salt water. It just it was in the harbour, and right out the harbour. She also had a love of adventure, and that's why at 16 she took a long trip to Canada. Oh, I got a job right away, same week, dipping chocolates. And were you ever tempted to eat them? Oh, I ate them all the time. But Jessie Jordan always kept her figure and stayed active all her life. She only stopped swimming when she was 101. 
Still, if you ask her the secret of longevity and happiness, she'll tell you one thing. I think peace is more like happiness. Peace. Having peace in your heart. Mm -hmm. Not holding any grudge against anyone. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. And if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Mm -hmm. It's as plain as that. She says that peace comes from knowing God. The Lord is good, mm -hmm. and his mercy endureth forever. Those who have sinned a lot love a lot, and I love them very much. Oh. I've sinned just... Mm -hmm. we, all, we all sin, but I sinned, and... Uh, and he's forgiven me. And there's forgiveness for everyone who believes that he is the Son of God mm -hmm. who died and rose again. House forevermore. Death isn't something most of us like to think about. Not Jessie. She says she's ready for heaven. Be beautiful. I've been there, nearly there a couple of times. And it's not nice coming back. <laughs> Just somebody comes and disturbs me. But heaven will have to wait at least for today, when there's a big birthday party to attend. She is an inspiration. She's one that shows you that no matter what your age is, you shouldn't stop doing things. You shouldn't stop being active. She's up helping with the baking group, baking things with the other residents. She comes to church every week. She's knitting. She's doing exercises. She can bring her knees up to her forehead. At 105, it, not many people can do that. It's that kind of inspiration that draws a crowd. Among them, community leaders and even local celebrities. There you go. Look over there. Hockey legend Paul Henderson made a surprise appearance for Jordan a lifelong hockey fan, though she couldn't quite place him. Do you remember a hockey player by the name of Paul Henderson? No, but I have a, my favorite one is... Uh... <laughs> Henderson didn't take it personally. He was just happy to play a part of celebrating her life. You know, we're, we're so fortunate to live in this country, and I can't think of anybody that's been more blessed than me. And so I've got a wonderful wife that really encourages to, you know, what can we give back? What can we, uh, how can we encourage somebody else? And so when you're invited to a 105th birthday party, you shut everything else down and you show up uh, just to be a part of a day. So uh, very, very fortunate guy. At the end of the day, those celebrating Jordan the most are the ones who know her best, her three daughters and son. She always had great faith. Um, she had uh, taught us a lot about health fitness and she loved us most of all. She's held the whole family together and that's very important. Taught us to be fearless, fearless and uh, in a day and age when, when people are so constantly gripped with fear, she taught us to be very fearless. Um, one reason for her preservation, you mentioned that earlier, I would say uh, because she takes charge of her own life, like she doesn't get it, lead it to anybody even here. Um, she would always say, I will ask you to help me when I need your help, and I'm still waiting. At 105, there are still a lot of things she's able to do, like cut her own birthday cake. For Jordan, it's not the sweetest part of this day. You know that so many people care for me. Sometimes you feel very lonely okay. and not worth anything, you know. You might just as well be gone, but... They all wish me a happy birthday. So that makes me happy. Although she can't remember some things, there are other things that have stayed with her all her life. A Psalm of Life by Longfellow is one of her favorite poems, one that's especially poignant as she nears the horizon. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they might seem. Life is real, life is earnest, 
And the grave is not the goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Footprints that perhaps another sailing o'er life saw main a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. And the waiting is so difficult. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jesse Jordan. In Toronto, Denise Lottie, 100 Huntley Street. Erickson's final stage in his psychosocial development theory is ego integrity versus despair. So he says the major task or crisis at this age is to develop a sense of integrity, feel like your life has been well spent. Um, look back on your life with no regrets and realizing that the mistakes you made were just a part of life, that we all make mistakes, that we all have to grow from uh, these mistakes and that they're really good for us because they're learning experiences. And if we're able to look back on our lives and feel good about how it went and have no regrets, then we will not enter into a state of despair. So despair is when people look back over their lives and feel that they have made a lot of wrong decisions or more commonly that they didn't make enough decisions. In some cases that they didn't make any decisions at all, that they just kind of floated through life and they regret that. And so people that kind of are unable to achieve this integrity die unhappy, unfulfilled, and wish that they had another chance at life. So um, let's go ahead and watch a video now on this idea of life reflection and looking back over your life and um, doing so in order to gain a sense of ego integrity. Dr. Robert Butler, a psychologist, says it's important and healthy for each of us to look back at the mystery, the wonder of our lives. Uh, how did I get here? Uh, what uh, did I do well? Uh, what do I wish I'd done differently, better? Uh, this process of looking back is called the life review. The end result, the payoff of the life review can be a shoring up and a cohesiveness of one's character. That is integrity. One may have been fragmented for a long, long time about a variety of competing thoughts, guilts, conflicts. With the successful resolution of those, one may have a sense of integrity that one's never had before. And that doesn't necessarily mean something grand in the sense of a great memoir that's produced or a work of art. It may be pure survival in which someone can be very proud and feel very whole. In New York, a celebration for Minna Citron. She's an artist. I hope I don't lose my upper plate when I love. Oh, no, you're a little older than Jack Benny. Just don't lose it when you need it. I need help. You blow too. Oh, okay. My mother and father had four sons, and my mother felt terrible because she wanted a daughter. So they kept trying. So I finally came along, and I was the only daughter and they made a great fuss about me. I was in a co-ed school, manual training high school, and I guess I was in love with love, you know. And so I had lots of boys around that I was attracted to. And they loved to come to my mother's house because she was very friendly and beautiful. And I loved to listen to her because her taffeta petticoat rippled when she walked. And that petticoat had a ruffle on it, and it, um, uh, rhythm, you know, and I loved it. And the taffeta petticoat also had my mother in it, and I loved her. This young man that I went around with, and I finally got married. We were kids together. I was 16 and he was 18. And we had good times together, you see. He was a good playmate. 
But when you get married and you're having children, a playmate isn't exactly what you need. You need a thoughtful person to be a good father to your children and to recognize that if you are a different kind of person, they have to recognize that. You see, he used to say, I never know where to put my hat when I come in because you've moved the piano. You see, so why can't you be like other people and just stay put, do nothing? We had the two children, and I thought, that's it. That's all I want. I've got two children now. They're wonderful. And now what am I going to do with the rest of my life? So I went to the New York uh, School of Applied Design for Women, and I came out with some honors and stuff. And I realized I didn't know how to draw a figure. So I went to the Art Students League, and I signed up with Kenneth Hayes Miller, who said, do what you feel like doing takes courage to be a woman without any money and leave a man who is very comfortable and get out into the world. Well, I suppose courage is not lacking in me. It's difficult, but you do it. So um, I up and left. It's 50 years later, and at a gallery party in New York, friends pay tribute to Minna Citron's life and work. Her drawings and paintings in the turbulent 1930s showed a society in pain. But later, American abstract painters, including Jackson Pollock, had a freeing influence on Minna's art. I think art is a wonderful therapy. It's like a good physic. You know, it's a psychological physic. It got rid of a lot of tensions and a lot of difficulties. When you get to be my age, you don't think so much of future, you think more of past, you see? And uh, if you're talking about when you're 90, whether you're thinking about dying, you see, well, that's something people have to think about any time. Some people die younger, some people die older. I don't want to live to be terribly, terribly old. And when I die, that's that. But in the meantime, I just want to go on enjoying life if I can and working. I think I've done my best. It's a lot to take care of. I want to say that. Now, the painting for that is my largest painting, and my granddaughter out in Denver has it on loan, I hope. The paintings and the correspondence you have, with, I feel as though I'm curator to a career. And I just like to go on. And I love people, and I love my friends. And I like new friends like you. <laughs> I think in old age, people reap the perceived benefits of a long life. They can describe that life to you in terms of its richness, its complexity, its having savored many, many aspects of life and the humanity part of that. And while Dylan Thomas talked about going raging into that last good night, still most old people go gently into that last period uh, and of death and the preparation for death and not raging into it. There is an equanimity that comes over most older people and a sense of having uh, been a survivor and a coper and uh, in that sense having made it all right so this concludes this lecture and we will see you next time for chapter 19 our final lecture have a good day